First Sergeant Kev here with Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters. Captain Ethan Whitehall, Company D, Second United States Sharpshooters. And today we are wrapping up our research trip to the state of Maine, where we have been studying uh, sharpshooter history, visiting graves, seeing all their hometowns and sites, and of course eating a lot of local food. Original documents, can't forget that either. Yeah. Like the icing on the cake. Yeah, so we, we started out, we flew in uh, to Portland, and we spent a couple, like a day and a half there, and that's when we visited our first sharpshooter, uh, Captain Fessenden. Yep. Um, and then we headed up to Augusta, the capital of Maine, where the wonderful Captain Sulin, uh, legendary Company D historian, met us up there. We got our archivist researcher passes. And we spent two pretty long days going through all the original documentation filed by Company D. Um, yeah, how, how would you describe like your first experience kind of getting into the, um, the folders? Uh, I, that's the best I can come up with. It's just completely mind-blowing actually holding the original papers that Company D held. I mean, these are the actual ones, like, the ink has faded, and, like, you can see, like, little smudges from, you know, hands still touching wet ink. I really can't think of a word to describe it, really. Yeah, and, and we'll have we'll have the full write-up on, on our website at secondusss.com, so you can kind of just see the awe in our face yeah. as, as the captain, he started out kind of uh, curating... Uh, the experience of going through all, all the files and uh, seeing all the company reports, the descriptive roles, the morning reports, and still kind the of... enlistment papers, even. Yeah, so, so many enlistment papers. <laughs> um, yeah, and then you can find, you know, all the sorts of details, you know, the recruiting officers, and then uh, the regimental surgeon, and uh, where they were from... Uh, and hearing, it's one thing to kind of go through historical documentation on your own, but to go through it with another historian who's also from that area gives you so much more depth of perspective about uh, who the people were, what it was like from their area, what those families were famous or infamous for. Yeah, the, uh, the family that's full of fibbers, apparently <laughs> still to this day. <laughs> Um, and also just like their, his experience in going through the documentation and sort of the realities, like having, having spent his entire life in this state and knowing so many, practically everyone in this state, it seems like, oh, yes. um, he can look at some of the documentation and almost find inside jokes of the company. Yeah. Like the one thing that always drives, makes him laugh is the seeming like over-representation of red hair in the company especially from rockland where we're at right now yeah and so it, it seems like from a historical perspective it was sort of like a running joke so maybe there was like a red-headed person and then everyone just thought it was funny and then everyone had like auburn or red hair to just a crazy disproportionate amount of people that all yeah. matched that description and <clears throat> yeah and then the we were just kind of called it a day after that didn't we yeah i can't even remember we've we've been to so many places yeah um kind of went back just kind of a, a buzz of excitement being able to hold you know the exact same papers that that McC mcclure and fessenden uh, fessenden matthews barker barker and you know. then the the next day the the people at the main state archives are fantastic yes. wonderful people they, they Absolutely wonderful. Uh, they kept a lot of the records on the cart for us. So, so as soon as the archives opened the, the next morning, we were right in there. And then they, it's like, well, they came in and we were in the Civil War study room, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. And it's like, well, do you want the descriptive and muster rolls? And it's like, of uh, course. Yeah. <laughs> so they disappear and they come back a few minutes later with this big flat cart of all the descriptive muster rolls and you know, these these papers are huge oh yeah i mean it what four feet by three feet something like that it was ridiculously huge <laughs> and um 
Mrs. First Sergeant um, and Ethan and I, we were working as fast as we could to like take as many pictures yeah. of all the documents. And there were hundreds mm -hmm. of documents and, uh, and still trying to soak in. And then every once in a while, um, we, it'd be kind of quiet, people shuffling papers, and you just hear a gasp. Yeah, and something incredible happening, or just being able to see uh, something that you knew about through reading history books to yeah. actually see the moment that it happened and it was written down in paper. Well, it's like your find of the Second Regiment taking the Twenty Third Georgia yeah. captive at a uh, Chancellorsville. Mm -hmm. It's just like, oh, we all look over and like, <laughs> it's like, is that what a five year old Jared looked like in a toy store? <laughs> oh yeah, it was incredible. Um, and it's, it's, well, what's really crazy is the forms are already big, but yeah. the, the, the soldiers, they have to cram so much information in these forms. Right. Yeah. And then in this, in this one section was the after action report of, of essentially all the events around Chancellorsville. And in there was the uh, documentation of us capturing the 23rd Georgia um, and that was something Captain Sulin hadn't found before. I mean, he'd been through all the records, but there's so much. Oh. You have to go back time and time yeah. again and read every little detail. And so he was also really excited about that. And then uh, we kept going through more. And there's just, I mean, by, these giant, giant binders, essentially, <laughs> of all the Company D documents. Yeah. And one was saying, uh, one was a report. Um, what was it? Crockett signed it. He was he was commanding at the time, so probably Barker was a lieutenant, the captain maybe. Barker never became captain. It was just Crockett. So this That's is probably right. post July, maybe August of sixty three. That's to about right. Yeah, Early I want to say sixty four, maybe sixty five, because Crockett was um, court martialed and discharged. Ah, so. Yeah, that's um, a fun story. Yeah, and and so and in the bottom was a note in was um, of the last in the last month spent twenty four days on the skirmish line, yeah. and that was just like wow. That's being on duty, ready to fight, pretty much every single day for an if not month. fighting. Yes, if not I mean, fighting, sleeping on your arms, and uh, you could also see all the different detached service. Reports, yeah. which explains so much, because if you take those detached service reports, or extra duty, and then you combine that with their professions on the enlistment papers and muster rolls, things start to make a lot of sense. Um, Hussey, for example, was almost always detailed to the reg uh, uh, regimental Teamsters, yep. um, and that's because we think that because he worked in the lime industry, that he was probably working the animals going back between the quarry and the kilns. Yeah, and the so, carts and everything just loading down. Yeah, so when that duty came up, then he was constantly in those reports because he was already good at that. Yeah. Um, other names you, you'll see uh, came up time and again were co uh, commonly uh, on service to the, the hospital, yep. uh, the surgeon, or they're serving as a nurse. Uh, there was the one, too, that uh, took care of all the livestock. Yes, there was a livestock guard and all sorts of other details that correspond nicely to what they already did. And and that's one of those things that, you know, we, we talk a lot about on this channel and we try to remind people is that all these soldiers had day jobs and established careers before they went to war. And then when they had an opportunity to use that experience and that knowledge, they did it even during wartime. <laughs> And you just see that laid out time and time again with many of the same names. You'll occasionally see new names just because they had a, you know, do this duty or do that duty. Um, but you get all that, that minute detail. And so being in a place where they're from, well, it's like, well, we're, we're here in Rockland right now <clears throat> where 11 of the 27 members of Company D at Gettysburg were from. Yeah. Um, there's there's a, a lime quarry like a mile from here. And so yeah. you'll be bringing it down here. Then you have uh, you have the harbor. Uh, then uh, up, well, everything seems down east, regardless of which <laughs> way you're going in Maine. Um, but we went up. Was it uh, was it Belfast, where uh, we went by 
the, the building where James Matthews uh, worked um, in the newspaper business. Yeah. And then we uh, went uh, on a long tour, uh, two hours up to Cherryfield. The Tucker Twins. Yes, the Tucker Twins were buried out there. And we just thought it was, it was just a fitting opportunity for the captain to take us up there oh, yeah. and, and show us around. And, you know, you learn about, you, you, if you're out in the environment, it's pretty cold. I mean, if you're from the Northwest like we are, it's it's pretty chilly here still. Yeah. I mean, um, it's probably shorts weather for a lot of Mainers. <laughs> <clears throat> but, yeah, going all the way out to Cherryfield, Mrs. First Sergeant pointed out that one stretch through the wilderness, we must have driven, you know, 20 miles without seeing another car on the road and you really start to get the sense like well they were used to tough weather they oh, had yeah. tough jobs um these a few of the cities today that are kind of small were actually pretty big commerce centers during the civil war um but for the most part they were hard scrabble farmers um one of the first funny things that the captain told us was um a, uh, any rock this big or smaller is considered topsoil in me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, this basic root crops, they were probably just basic homesteaders and they had to hunt and fish and chop firewood and build everything on their own. So they were- Survive, essentially. <laughs> yeah, they, this these sharpshooters, based on their environment and their communities required them to be natural survivors. Yeah. And fiercely independent because if you're, um, on a homestead in the middle of nowhere in Cherryfield, then you have to be able to rely on yourself yeah. quite a bit. And they're used to the, the harsh weather yep. um, and knowing the environment, reading the terrain, if they're hunting or fishing, oh, yeah. um, if they're, if they're seamen, they're going to know weather conditions and the tough life of, you know, living on, on the sea. And again, with those professions, being here, we learn where they make distinctions and where they don't. So yeah. um, we asked uh, Captain Sulin, who is an actual retired sea captain, um, well, what does seaman mean on the forum? And it's like, well, all sailors call themselves seamen. Even a captain is likely to just write down seamen. So we don't know exactly what they did on the ship, but we know that a lot of the jobs like... Um, a sailmaker. Sailmaker, um, um, mechanic. Yep. Um, and then... Uh, there were like, some off-the-wall ones that <coughs> were... The gigger. Maritime. Yeah, the gigger. Now, it's not maritime related, but it's water related. Yep. Because we've also learned that all these major rivers uh, in Maine fueled uh, powered um, mills. And so you would have... And any kind of mill, really. I mean, lumber, gunpowder, uh, textile. Yes. Any kind of mill. Tanneries. Really. Yeah, tanneries. They all ran on water. And they needed heat source of somehow to, you know, do anything. Mm -hmm. Well, it's Maine. I mean, I don't think we can go two feet without running into a tree in the state. <laughs> which is kind of like home. So, I mean, the natural resources are right there for these people to actually have a job yeah. during the time. Yeah, and so that relationship with water. So we have a couple uh, shoemakers. Yep. And so, like, um, with tanneries, they need, they need water to soak the bark, and soak the hides. So pretty much every town in the area of any substance would have had a tannery. So of course you're gonna have shoemakers. Um, and then by going to the History Museum, we learned that uh, textiles were huge in Maine, yeah. but that men worked in the wool mills and women worked in the cotton mills. So that, yeah, was, that which was, was really weird. So when Company D has a gigger, who the process of, what is it, taking the, the fuzz yeah, or something. So basically you're taking the as I read it when we did that research, because we're like, what's a gigger? <laughs> um, you take the kind of the nap of mm -hmm. the wool and you, uh, it was really vague on the process, but like you tumble it or you like rub it down and it takes uh, the nap down to uh, not the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, like the twill yeah. of the fibers, but just almost to a finished product. Yeah. Um, and again, you need to have water to power the line drives to run all the equipment <laughs> in those areas. Um, and yeah, we went by, it seemed like everyone in the war 
served in Maine at some point. <laughs> um, whether it's like the the, the Kennebec Armory, uh, we yep. learned uh, Montgomery Meggs, the uh, U.S. Quartermaster, was in Fort Knox, which was up by Belfast. Belfast. And, and so they were already up here, and so they, they knew the area. Maine was already involved in so much industry. It was already the shipping, sailing capital of the world. And Maine was at the heart of everything. And, yeah, and just be able to go into museums and see all these original things, learn about the industries, understand their trades, um, walk the same streets, look at the same sites that they did, and learn some you know, really awesome, exciting things. And yeah. eat some modern main stuff to say that oh, we did it. Gotta do the fun touristy stuff. Um, and then the other thing too is maritime culture is huge. Oh, okay. So we went to the main maritime museum, In which was, Bath. yeah. That we, was incredible. Yeah, and, and so Ethan's also really into like all military and keeps up with modern military stuff. So on our way in, you noticed uh, an early Burke uh, class three destroyer just sitting in a dry dock. I'm like, hey, yeah, that's, that's, you know, just start spouting off. Oh, it's an early Burke. You know, it might be in dry dock and not thinking, oh, yeah, Bath Ironworks. No, they make ships here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just like, oh, well, that, that's neat. It's a big body of water. That makes sense. And we start going through the museum. It's like, oh, Bath Ironworks is still operational. Yeah. Um, and they're working on the last of the zoom wall zoom walls. And so that is entirely built right next to the Maritime Museum because and the museum is the last surviving shipyard in America. Yeah. Like um, old timey shipyard. Yeah, old timey shipyard. Yeah. And uh so they had uh all the, the blacksmith shop, they had the, the joinery shop, the Which you were it was amazing. Like kid yeah. the candy yeah. store. Yeah, the, the the old machinery, the 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 line drive equipment was fantastic. Then they had the the, the rope, cell making, canvas stuff. You could see all the tools, the all artwork. in one building too. Yeah, it's like a shipmaker's toolbox. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then we got to go to the boat building um, classroom that they have upstairs in another building. That was really cool. And we could see all the different types of ships um, and sort of like the history of local ships and then the regional differences in the ships and. You stumbled upon a, a Whitehall model. Yeah. Remote. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> Seems like you know, no matter what we do, there's a Whitehall named something, which I think is... My family were kind of jack of all trades. <laughs> it seems Once like we it. came to America, it's just like, oh, we'll be pharmacists, we'll be farmers, we'll do this. Apparently, robots too. <laughs> um, and they had a big uh, exhibit for um, uh, lobster, like the yeah. lobster trade. Um and some fun stuff along along the way. And they had the, the caulking shed. Yep, that was really cool. So we, um, I think we did have like a caulker in Company D. I believe so. Yeah, I can't remember who it was. But yeah, so there was a caulker. So we got to see all the tools they would have used, um, the materials, uh, like the the pro like the unprocessed hemp that they would use to, to fill the seams of the ships. Oakum. Oakum. You didn't know what Oakum was until yeah, you I saw mean, that I, I, exhibit. I knew that he stuck it in the gaps between the planks but i didn't know it was made out of like unprocessed hemp so yeah. that was really cool and you could, you could what's crazy like we've been able to touch just about everything out here yeah um and then we came to rockland went to the rockland historical society uh spent a bit of time there and then we went up to the library where we just had a teensy amount of time yeah. we could spend weeks because they have all the local newspapers on microfilm from about like 1853, like three, I think was the earliest day yeah. to present like, day. Yeah. And so we were able to go, we found uh, like a, like sort of essentially like a handbill that Berdan had posted in the Rockland Republican. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was called the Rockland Gazette. But Good it was, Gazette. Yeah. But it was known as the Rockland Republican Gazette. And then there was, was the Rockland Democratic Press. Free Press. Yes. Uh, and that was the one that Matthews wrote for. And so we were kind of scrolling through it. I wanted to look at um, ads uh, for businesses that were in Rockland. So if we did like first person, then we, oh, we could talk about, um, you know, the hat shop or the pharmacy down the street um, as if we had known about them. Yeah. yeah. So it's that, it's that consumer culture. It's that local culture that really fuels um, research and your impression because then you actually know 
the hometown that your unit was from or that your person was from. Yeah, and that's also the cool part that you're kind of touching on with it was like, you know, you can read these names and, you know, especially us being in the Northwest, like you said earlier, you know, we pronounce everything, you know, phonetically. So as we see it, you know, like we were calling it, what, a uh, Wickaset? Yeah. And it's actually Wiscasset. Yeah. So, and of course the Manor accent, which is... Awesome. Oh yeah. I mean, when we first got into Portland, we didn't really hear it, but like the more, you know... <laughs> well, for the North ego, it seems like. Yeah, it gets a little more pronounced, a little more pronounced. And then when we met with uh, Captain Sulin, that was just like... Oh, please. Just narrate a book for me. <laughs> can, can, can you do my voicemail? Because that would be fantastic. Yeah, but, um, um, there was... Uh, wasn't there... Um, oh, yeah, and, like, names and stuff, too. Like, oh, yeah. Um, the Civil War General uh, Adelbert. Adelbert, instead of Ad or Adelbert yeah. names. No, it's Adelbert yeah. names. And if you're from Maine, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. But if you're a historian reading a book, or, you know, in a documentary, you're going to say Adelbert. Yeah. So there's all these little like historic differences in the way names are pronounced, uh, place names that make such a huge difference. So it's not always just drill and uniform and knowing, you know, this this military maneuver on some battle map. Yeah. And there's there's a depth of knowledge that makes you really appreciate who your people were and what they actually contributed and how they how they could have seen the war slightly differently. Yeah. I mean, it actually gives. A person to the name that you read about on a roster it's like oh yeah they're so-and-so like oh wow this is actually where they were from these are the towns that they would have talked about this yeah. is you know the sites they would have seen yeah and and then just having you know driving out in the middle of nowhere and just beautiful Maine oh, God. and the state of Maine yes and and just another having, thing we learned <laughs> yeah, and having all these conversations with the captain about like the culture of Maine and one thing in We've read all the diaries that, you know, we, we, we can get our hands on. And one of the things that really comes up that makes a lot of sense with what we've read is that Mainers don't complain. No, they don't. And, Ever. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and except for, like, you know, except in, in White's diary, the only time he gets mad or gets angry or willing to fight somebody is if they, they break some sort of, like, social norm yeah like some weird taboo they're rude um you know they're not following common courtesy or politeness but they don't complain about the the ruggedness of the battle or the you know lack of provisions all that much the temperature the te you've been asking everyone in maine you know you know so you know what what is cold to a mainer and they just say cold <laughs> there's not a specific temperature yeah not one actually <laughs> answered like there's no it's like, well, it's been minus 20 before, but yeah, just wear layers. Well, it's like today in the antique shop when I kind of just wandered off on my own, uh, the two uh, older old, eh, older ladies of the counter, they started chatting, which is another thing we've kind of learned is everyone here in Maine is super friendly and loves to talk. Yes. And they're talking about the wind gusts. And you're like, wow, it's really gusty out. And, yeah, yeah, it is. It's kind of crazy out there, you know. I guess I was complaining a little bit like, but you know, it wasn't as bad as it was a couple years ago because that really blew some trees down, but it wasn't as bad as the couple years before that. And, oh, but the, the windstorm back in like 87, that was, that was a real blower. But I did not hear bad, horrible, <laughs> horrendous. Just yeah. Like, it was inconvenient. It was too yeah. cold. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, you know, even though what we do, you know, it was 150 years ago, a lot of that culture still remains in those regions from these units. So just it's feel free to like expand your horizons. Um, if you can, it is totally worth saving up your money and oh, going yeah. to these places. Um, it's fun to hit like the, the big famous battlefields um, and, you know, do a reenactment there. But it's it's even better to take a vacation to your unit's hometown, you know, eat you know, eat the local food. They probably eaten. I've eaten tons of seafood while I was I, while lobster I, rolls. I think are your most commonly eaten thing. Yes, so far. yeah. I, I did try to eat one every single day I was here, but we were traveling so much we uh -huh. had one day of just gas station food. Especially yes, yeah, yeah, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> just like uh, Cliff Bart. Uh, yeah. Um, but also too, if you get a chance to like look at those, uh, one thing we were also looking at in newspapers is like, yeah, we want to see. We were trying to you know, want to find like Matthews. Uh, notes from a correspondent, um, but also like stopping for like major historical events so that way we can see 
what the locals here how they saw the war what oh, their yeah. opinions were like did they were they happy were they upset uh what were the last thing we did before we left the library was print off an editorial uh from the rockland uh democrat about their what their thoughts were on the emancipation proclamation yeah that was really cool to find because that would have been sort of like a common cultural understanding for a portion of the population and then so you have like the democratic free press and you have the republican gazette and so you kind of have these different like political differences and leanings and you, you kind of like figure out where everyone was, what side they took, uh, but also just the different lenses or any the things that they would have talked about around the campfire. Yeah. Uh, but it also makes sense, you know, uh, the fact that when you read like um, Matthew's diaries, how, why he was always wanting newspapers. Yeah. Because he, yeah. he worked in the news, in, he was a newspaper man. And also, like, uh, the captain reminded us, he knew what they were worth. Yeah. So you Information. could... Get, yeah. Knowledge you, is power. You yeah. could get a lot for being able to trade a good newspaper to somebody else in the army when you were done with it. So having his, having his sister send him, you know, and his mom send him newspapers the whole time during the war. Yeah, Ned. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, yeah, doing some more um, grave hunting around here. Uh, yep. Edgar Crockett was... A lot, Actually, surprisingly hard to find. Yeah. Even though he was like right in front of us for half the time. Yeah, he's a stone's throw for Matthews. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, like a 1.4 miles from our hotel here in uh, yeah. Rockland is Acorn Cemetery. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those things. Um, gosh, what else? Anything else that stood out for you? Uh, besides everything? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I've... I've never been to Maine, so this is a huge like first trip for me, and it's an absolutely beautiful state. Like that's just my big take from it, also. But besides that, actually being able to hold original documents, not just you know pertaining to sharpshooters, but anything Maine related, mm -hmm. is because they kept such good records because the Civil War really broke Maine financially. Yeah, and they were bro broke to begin with. Yeah. So, I mean, they were keeping track of every single penny going in and out of the state. And Maine did try to take very good care of their soldiers. Um, we saw in a few reports where uh, the sharpshooter, you know, well, not even a sharpshooter, just anyone, really, they would have a, they would lose a knapsack, for instance. The state of Maine would pay the government for that knapsack. Yeah. Instead of taking it out of that soldier's pay, it's like, no, we sent our, boy, our men and boys to fight. We're not going to take money away from them. They are earning their money right now. Yeah. It's like, whoa, that... How many other states would do that, really? Well, and, and that, I'm, I'm, I almost totally forgot, like, the, the first day, like, holy cow moment for me was that the paperwork is so important because in the enlistment papers was a guy claiming to be a second United States sharpshooter yeah. who sent his bounty... To the to a local town in Maine. Yeah, and it was like the wrong town or something like that. Yeah, and so and we also learned about like the, like the system of government in like Maine small towns where they have like select men on yeah. the town hall, so they have three select men, and as moderators essentially is what they would do in yeah town politics. And and so we had this enlistment form for this person being a sharpshooter, and so he was getting he was due his two hundred dollar bounty, and so that bounty had to be. Uh, paid by the city uh, who was uh, claiming the quota for enlistment. Yeah. And so when that uh, enlistment form got to the select man, he was like, I have no idea. This person has never lived in this yeah. town. I mean, I it was know. a very, like, heated letter, too. It was short. Yeah, for, like, 1862, heated. that was, like, that was a flaming, mad e uh, letter. Yeah, but uh, he stayed in the sharpshooters because I think we were finding records of, like, 64 and yeah, it was a uh, white. Oh, I think that's who it was. Yeah, and we're still seeing his name popping mm -hmm. up: Charles White, Charles White, Charles White. All right. Well, apparently, he yeah, got he got his bounty somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah, he claimed that, but maybe he was trying to squeeze in some money from some other towns by claiming mm -hmm. quota. Because there's also a big question of what actually counts as your place of residence, like where you're from. Yeah. And, like, I guess, like, Maine had talked to the Attorney General. Yeah. And, like, it actually is, like, what it you're from wherever you say you are. Yeah. And so that caused a headache for small towns 
who didn't have a lot of money because like, oh, well, I'm from blah, blah, blah. I'm from, you know, Machias. And you're not from Machias, but they still have to pay that $200 for yeah. that bounty. And so you get this, this depth of story and all these old dusty records uh, at the archives. That was... <laughs> That was that was awesome. Yeah, that, that was absolutely yeah. fantastic. Plus, there's letters to like the governor of Maine from Hiram Burdan, mm -hmm. and we got to actually hold those with our bare hands. It's just like I hate Burdan, but this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, and we were starting to get to a point where we could actually recognize the documents because we're getting used to their handwriting. Yeah, it's like oh, this is a McClure, you know, this one's this one's a Crockett. Um, this one was clearly written in the field because it's hammered and barely legible. Yeah. Um, I took measurements of paper. A lot of the forms were handmade in the field with different colors of ink and the rhymes. Yeah. yeah, that was the cool. <laughs> that was cool. Um, and just sort of like the inconsistencies because in Company D, we, you know, so many of the campaigners like, oh, it has to be this way. The manual says this, and it must be exactly that, or it's far. It's like we had hundreds of enlistment papers and documents, yeah. and they were all different sizes. Granted, yeah. sometimes, but like the teeniest little bit. Oh yeah, and some by like a good quarter to half an inch. There was eight and a half by by eleven. I, yeah, I, I, I was there. It was slightly smaller, like a eight sixteenth of an inch short of eleven. Yeah, but it was like modern notebook paper. Yeah, different weights, different styles of paper, um, different types of ink, different forms. Yeah. What, yeah. what was that? That was uh, oh, that, that wasn't the Civil War, but it was like Maine was you know tight. So when it, Maine became a state, they still had the Massachusetts seal. Yeah, and so Mass uh, the state of Maine would just cross out the heading <laughs> and write "State of Maine" yeah. <laughs> and reuse the paperwork. Yeah, and so you would have different headers for different different enlistment forms, um, and we could see how. If you've ever done like a morning report and you, you have maybe like a specialty unit, the, those forms don't fit everyone. So yeah. you would, so we learned how they would, um, I, mean, I took pictures on how they would abbreviate the the superscript end, you know, for like second or like it would yeah. cross out things, write volunteers, you write uh, sharpshooters. And the cool um, one was, uh, I'm not sure who the officer was signing them off. It might have been Fessenden, but instead of sharpshooters, it was rifle sharpshooters. Sharp yeah. That's like, Okay, that that was early like, war. I think. Yeah, yeah. So why is that such a difference? But you know, no, they want to state the fact that no, we are riflemen. We're not just sharpshooters. No, we are actual true riflemen. <laughs> it's like you know, you don't call a marine a soldier. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, let's see what else was that? Um, yeah. So yeah, well, we'll have we've been posting a lot of pictures to our private Facebook page. Um. But once we get back in the state of Washington, uh, we'll have a bunch of information and stuff available to you from our finds here um, on our it's website <laughs> at secondusss.com. Yeah, it's gonna, we have hundreds and hundreds of photographs of documents that will take us a long time. But the, the main sites, uh, you know, the, the graves, some of the more exciting documents, the places that we've been, we'll be sure to share that with you so you can uh, follow along yeah um well we need to start uh to get going uh the captain is going to make uh make us a lobster dinner not this captain no captain no. Sula. <laughs> yeah. so we need to wrap up our main trip with, in a very main way tonight so thanks as always for liking and subscribing and thanks for all your wonderful comments and uh thanks for being patient uh we haven't been putting out videos for a while but now you know where we've been and what we've been doing um, thanks so much for subscribing, and we'll see you next time.